Expedition 44, welcome to our first full episode on atonement. We did an introduction to this already that you're going to want to watch first. Today is on sacrifices and this is where you'll find me going to a lot. Not just talking about atonement, but everything starts with what we're talking about today. And Matt and I always make references to the sacrificial system and it's really important because it's the basis for covenant. And so if you don't understand the sacrificial system and covenant, which I would say most people don't understand, yeah. you're gonna have a really hard time getting to the rest of theology in life. And this is where I said in the introduction that so much of this, your, your view of atonement is going to influence the rest of your theological thinking on huge things. And so Matt, today we're talking about sacrifice, where are we going? Um, so yeah, we're talking about specifically Leviticus 1 to 5, which is where the covenant sacrificial system is is outlined. And so really what we're doing in these like first four videos, let's say, is setting up a framework for when we get to the New Testament and how we should interpret hermeneutically um, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. It's um, depicted in the New Testament as a sacrifice or an offering. Yeah. So if that is a sacrifice or an offering, we should understand to the Hebrew mind what a sacrifice or what an offering meant. was. Yeah. Now, one of the problems that we have is we're, we're not intentionally trying to beat up on the PSA form of atonement, and we're going to kind of, you know, branch into a little bit of maybe even kind of disbanding some notions of other atonement theories when mm -hmm. it gets into this of ransom theory and stuff like that but we need to kind of just for a second say that a lot of the particularly PSA theory is going to be based on some things that just don't work in the mm -hmm. sacrificial system if you understand the sacrificial system at all when you get to a PSA atonement theory, you would think it just completely doesn't line up. Yeah, and especially a lot of times we have these assumptions of New Testament atonement in the yeah. West, and we read those back into the Old Testament. So, and, so we're talking about wrath, legal mm -hmm. transactions. Purchasing forgiveness, yeah. um, those type of things. And as we'll work through the different sacrifices, the five different sacrifices here in Leviticus 1 to 5, and yeah. we'll see if those are actually present or not. Yeah, okay. So... The first thing we kind of want to address is context. This is a texture of interpretation, and when we talk about context, we're talking about when we say sacrifice, what, what are we talking about? Yeah, so we need to ask, uh, like, why did the Israelites sacrifice? And we recall numerous um, patriarchs and leaders who built altars with yeah. regularity in the Old Testament. Uh, Noah in Genesis 8, uh, Abraham in Genesis 12, Isaac, Genesis 26, yep. Jacob, Genesis 32 and 35. We got Moses, Exodus yep. 18, Joshua in Joshua 8 and Deuteronomy 27, Gideon in Judges 6, David in 2 Samuel 24. All of these indicate that these individuals are simply following cultural norms, um, whether they're living before or after the time of Moses. So a lot of people use these films as Bible studies, and this is one of those times where I would pause the film and I would go through and spend a whole day just reading through these right now, because mm -hmm. each one of them is really important. And um, when I branched into you know studying the Levitical system this is where I started I, I started by going through each one of these references Matt just gave you and really reading what it was like and I think what you're gonna find from the very beginning is that all the things you've always heard that the Levitical system is about looks very different when you actually go and read every single one of these sacrificial uh, times in the Bible so when we look at some archaeological evidence of sacrifices, um, we see that evidence tells us that Canaanite altars within Israel um, within the 14th and 13th centuries BC um, and forward, so uh, we see those there and we suspect that kind of uh, this tells us that all the nations before that time were also sacrificing. So. So this is where we kind of get it back into a Deuteronomy 32 mindset. I remember when I was five and I realized that the gods of the Old Testament weren't just made up or fictitious, mm -hmm. that there actually were 
gods in the Old Testament. To this day, whenever I talk about this, mm -hmm. I have people say that. Say, Ryan, are you actually telling me that there were other gods in the Old Testament? And I'm saying, not only that, but there's probably other gods today. That these aren't just idols like TV mm -hmm. and radio and yeah. stuff like that. That there are real deities out there. There were and there still are. Perhaps they're bound, mm -hmm. but they still exist. And so, when you look at that, everybody in the ancient world was really understanding of these gods mm -hmm. and everything was kind of living to appease to make them happy to get along with them yep. it was the common thought in that society that the gods were not necessarily for you that they could be against yep. you and that's why in our worship today we keep reiterating the scripture of God is for us. God mm -hmm. is for us. And that might sound sound really funny to our Western mind. Why do we keep singing that over and over and over? Well, if you were to take yourself and transplant yourself into the ancient uh, Israelite and even Canaanite place, they weren't sure if the gods were for them or not. Yeah. They were continually trying to appease the gods so that they could find honor or sacred yeah. space the idea of relationship with those gods wasn't really there yeah and that's what made yahweh interesting yeah especially the sacrifices when you look um at the other cultures of sacrifice like the the sacrifice of animals is really to feed their gods and we yeah. see in the scripture that yahweh doesn't need to be fed right uh, but rather when the sacrifices happen you get to eat the food so it's more of a community meal yeah <laughs> and we'll get into that a little more but uh daniel block has also pointed this out the all the categories of sacrifices that are found in leviticus 1 to 5 you'll find outside of israel which yeah. is really interesting so, it is really interesting so in hebrew we're going to get a set of words and in Hebrew words are always kind of related to each other. But this is where interpretation gets really sketchy because we always want to be consistent with our interpretations. But in Hebrew, we find times where we have consistency, where a word means the same thing mm -hmm. over and over and over. And then as we start to see those patterns, we can pull from that. Mm -hmm. But then we also have times where they don't, Yeah, where we're like, Sometimes I even talk about this, they're polar opposites. Yep. It uses one word to say something and it uses the polar opposite of the word to essentially say the same thing. And so Hebrew is way more complicated. And so one of the things that we're going to seek today is to try to understand when, when we see that consistency and when we don't see that consistency. And so um, you, you mentioned a little bit about Leviticus 1 through 5 and there's several different types of things that are going to be mentioned here. And before we really get into this, I just want to kind of quickly summarize what we're talking about today. So it's important that when we talk about sacrifices, offerings, things like that, that from the very beginning, we get these systematically understood. Because if you don't, there tends to be, I mean, today in theology, I see these just thrown in. Like like they're all just thrown into a basket and shaken up and, you know, it's like they're picking one to mean something when they had very different meanings. And so uh, at first, I, I think that when we talk about sacrifice or sacrificial meals, you're you're gonna kind of get the zaba word, or there's also some other ones that come with that too. You're also gonna get peace or well-being offerings, and that's a uh, zalmon or salmamas. You sometimes get that too. There's ola, which I'm gonna come back to in a second, and then there's um, minksha, which is a gift or a grain. Now. The gift and grain one we see a lot too, over 200 times in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. So this is one that we're going to get into and kind of talk about what is a gift offering. But the other one, Ola, that I kind of just went over, that's an interesting one. This is actually, out of all the words, this is used the most, over mm -hmm. 280 times in the Old Testament. Now what's interesting is it's a feminine form of a noun. Now. You might say, why does this have significance? So it's talking about the whole burnt offering. And so we're going to get into this, but when, when you had a burnt offering, everything was consumed by fire. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anything left in that. And so this is the feminine form of this. Now, in Hebrew, again, things are kind of loose, but you get into the other form of this, and this is kind of going to kind of blow you away. What you get when you look at the masculine form of the verb 
is Elyon. Wow. Most so high. most high is what Elyon means. And so you're taking this and you're going to have to make some connections because we I could make a whole film just on this one topic. But you're getting the idea of sacrifice in the Bible, meaning a feminine form. And why is feminine important? Because I hate to say this, guys, but guys are prideful throughout mm -hmm. the Bible. We get this over and over and over. And in a spiritual sense, they're really, when you're talking about the the deities, the spirits, there's hardly ever a masculine feminine. It's really that there there is no gender. So these words, when we see masculine and feminine, are actually used to describe earthly system. That mm -hmm. God put a male and a female to come together as a three part. And so as you get this, you're getting some things, and when we get the the feminine, the idea here is that there are traits within the human feminine parts that are going to be better presented that way without pride in this case. Mm -hmm. And so Elian, you're going to get as the God most high. Now there's some other things here. This is interesting. When you look at the word Ola, uh, I'll use Ezekiel 40, 26, but there's a lot of versions of this that you get the idea of an ascent or a stairway. And so in the New Testament, well, even in the Old Testament, you're going to get Judges 1.15, Joshua 15.19, 2 Kings 4.10, Deuteronomy 26.19, where you take this idea of sacrifice, and it's the idea of going to an upper place. So the original sacrifice starts on what we might call the threshing floor or the offering floor, and eventually it takes you to the upper room. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, um, a couple questions we should look at here is, um, is when we look at sacrifice, could it be that Yahweh allowed sacrifice as an expression of religious devotion rather than demanding it? So this whole film, I want you to be thinking about this. Yep. This is key to this entire conversation. Did God actually come along and say, this blood sacrifice is the, exactly the way I want to do it. It seems like we get that a little bit in the Bible. Mm -hmm. You have these verses that are saying, when you sacrifice, sacrifice this way. So yep. it would, would at first to, the, to a Western mind reader seem like God mm -hmm. is saying, this yep. is exactly how I want you to present these blood sacrifices. But when you really get into the context mm -hmm. of reading, and I'm going to challenge you, people are going to right away, if you're yep. a theologian, especially of, of any kind of past reform nature, you're going to, you're going to be going, oh, I don't know about that. But I'm going to challenge you to look up every single one of them from the context that perhaps this wasn't God's ideal. Yeah, right? we already saw that outside of Israel that it was cultural. Yes. Is God taking something that's cultural and not completely removing Israel from their out culture, but spinning that to make it set apart for him as a way to religiously devote themselves yes. to God, to show their allegiance to God rather than the gods of the nations. And we see that when we go through all these sacrifices, though they have some overlap with that, um, they are completely different in meaning yes. than the pagan cultures. So eventually I'm going to write a book, and this is one I'm working on right now in my mind and will be put to paper of what is God's ideals. Throughout the scripture, we seemingly get these things that God says, this is what I want. But then we get other places where this is beautiful, where God mm -hmm. just meets us takes us where we're at, and then refines us. Mm -hmm. And so is blood part of the refinement? Is it so, so necessarily frame it like this. Is God necessarily coming along and saying, this is the way I want you to do it? Mm -hmm. Or is he taking the cultural context and making it better, making yeah. it holy? And you might notice we're wearing our set apart shirts and we're going to yeah. get into this. The word for this is kadosh. And Kadosh itself just means set apart. In fact, we're going to find in this study that often yeah. it means set apart for death. death. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's that would be a context you'd understand it. But it's a word that's been taken. And in the Old Testament system, it's taking something that was given, something that was understood, and it's making it holy. Yep. And so that's the whole idea here is that God is taking people where they were in their messed up cultural context, and he's going to find a way to bring that into safety sacred understanding. Yep. Um, so the next thing we're going to get into is our s forgiveness of sins and sacrifice connected. Um, so a lot of times we'll connect uh, the shedding of blood with forgiveness of sins yeah. and we'll maybe get to that. We'll get to that later when we get yeah. to Hebrews 
but we need to examine like what what does this mean so uh, we know from many stories in the bible that sin wasn't necessarily solved through sacrifice exactly we get that a lot yep. um exodus 23 deuteronomy 29 joshua 24 the list could go on and on uh, so this is important because Yahweh is always going to have the right to refuse sacrifice. And mm -hmm. so if if it's linked to forgiveness, theologically, this mm -hmm. is going to be problematic. Yeah. When does he take it? When does he when, when does he not take it? So yep. keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, so some answers in Genesis <laughs> yeah. take that uh, Genesis 3.21 where... We mean, have some friends at the ark today. Yeah, too. <laughs> yeah, means that God made a sacrifice for Adam and Eve, and this is problematic because yeah. they will say that oh, this is the first sacrifice right. that was made. First, it only says that God clothed them with animal skins. Yeah. It doesn't ever say in the text that uh, that um, God made a sacrifice now, for his. Some people even say that this is payment. You mm -hmm. know that they they're going to say that there's a payment thing going on there, and when you read the original text, th there's just it no, all has to be read in. Yeah, yeah, there's no reference for so, that. So there's no payment here for forgiveness. Um, and what is in the text though is Genesis three fifteen, which follows this, and it says, "I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between this he's talking to the serpent here, between your offspring and hers." He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So this doesn't talk about anything about payment, but what God promises to do rather than repay a debt is to defeat the enemy and yeah. free you from his power. So why is this important? Within the PSA understanding, you're going to see these things kind of starting to build that there needs to be a, a payment or mm -hmm. a, a repayment or something like that. And what we read here is it's actually not that at all. In mm -hmm. fact, I would say it's a better are you meant for a Christus Victor mm -hmm. form of Framework. atonement. Yep. Yeah, yeah. and the next, uh, when we see sacrifice um, in the Bible, so that was kind of the first place that people assume sacrifice. The next is yeah. Cain and Abel. Um, it's interesting, blood sacrifice for forgiveness has to be read into the text here. Yeah. And actually, it says, Abel brings fat portions as an offering. If you look at Josephus, the way that he reads this, yeah. is that Abel brought milk. Right. He, it doesn't say that he brought an animal and killed it. So within some framework, and more than just PSA, I mean, you could get this in ransom theory and other things, yep. there, there, there's people trying to build a kind of connection with individual moral sense. Mm -hmm. And when we look at it, you don't need to go there. In yeah. fact, I wouldn't go there. It's, yep. There's no link between that and forgiveness. Yeah. So let's actually get into the text here. Uh, Leviticus chapter 1. I'll read the first four verses here. And then we'll uh, get into the burnt offering. Right. So, uh, the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When anyone is saying you shall bring an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent, tent of meeting that he should be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord. Aaron's sons the priest shall bring the blood and throw it against the sides of the altar at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So the first thing when you're ever looking at Levitical offerings is to separate the difference between an offering and a sacrifice. Yep. This this is stage one, and I'm always surprised by how many people don't know that there's a difference between them. So just purely looking at Leviticus here, what's the difference between an offering and a sacrifice? So offerings completely get burnt up. Yep. They all go to the Lord. Yeah, this and this is consumed by fire. In mm -hmm. fact, in Hebrew, that's really what it me means, is that it's completely consumed by fire. It's, Im it's important to look at it that way because you might say, you might remember 1 Kings 18 when Elijah is up on Mount Carmel and he's, he's like throwing uh, water on it. So there's yep. no question that this is God completely consuming this. Mm -hmm. And... As, as we look, anytime God burns fire, anytime you see that, they're almost completely burned up. But we also have to keep that separate from sacrifice. What does mm -hmm. it mean to offer a sacrifice? So a sacrifice, uh, the best parts of the animal get burnt to the Lord, but the rest of it is a community meal. Yeah. So it's communion. A, That's the, it's, it's communing with your God. It's having a meal with your God. So we don't necessarily is. celebrate communion the way I prefer to celebrate communion. Mm -hmm. Instead of coming around with the little pieces of bread and wine and everything, 
I think the traditional and Messianic Jews get this closer when they actually sit down and have this long meal and talk about the significance of it and everything Mm -hmm. else. Yeah, so the first word here is korban, or uh, korav, which is the verb form of presenting an offering. So the idea here is that it's a gift. So that's the whole point. Now this is interesting. You might you might remember me talking about this in battle. I've mm-hmm. I brought this out a couple yeah. times, but this this Hebrew word after battle is used when when they're kind of offering up a sacrifice for those that have fallen, and they're not just offering up those that have fallen for them. They're offering up the other side too. And yeah. so I I joke about this a mm-hmm. lot of times that people say there's no evangelism in the Old Testament, and there was. It was just. Killing them was evangelism yep. because there was a thought that in giving that gift sacrifice to God that perhaps, and they had very vague understandings of afterlife, they had no concept yep. of heaven or anything like that at this point, but there was a thought that by doing this, there might still be a chance for that person to enter some kind of afterlife. And most of their ideas of that were, like I said, really messed up. Yep. Yeah, so the big key here with the burnt offering is that um, when you come before the Lord's house, you burn this offering, and the key is not so much that I've got sins that need to be dealt with, I want, I need sins forgiven. The thing is, God, I just want to spend time with you. It's like when you're invited over for dinner for somebody, you br- sometimes bring a gift or offer yeah. to bring a side or something, and that's really what this offering is. It's yep. saying, hey, God, I want to spend some time with you. Here's a gift. Please welcome me into your space. Yeah. And I think a lot of times we we come too easily to this throne. So I'm going to make some carryovers to New Testament, mm-hmm. although that's not really what this video is about. But, yep. you know, when we come to the presence of the Lord, sometimes we just, like I said, with communion, it's mm-hmm. like this, you know, half thought of thing. And I mean... Yep. The idea in the Levitical system was you should come before the Lord. This should take time. This should take of your best. It's not mm-hmm. just come to church on Sunday morning, have communion for 30 seconds yep. and go home. Yep. You know, this this is meant to be a serious commitment. And that's why the Sabbath was sacred. Because mm-hmm. they were saying that we don't want this just to be a five-minute ordeal. That we want you to give an entire day to make sure that you can enter into sacred relationship with Yahweh the Most High. Yeah, so this is basically a gift of reciprocity, and we've talked about the three graces in our yeah. gospel series. So uh, next, let's get into atonement. Um, so now the three graces is yeah. important. Oh yeah. Here. So let let's just let's touch on this that. for a second. Yeah. We've got whole videos on this. Matt does a great job, kind of going through it. But the three graces is important. If you don't understand that framework, watch some of those videos that talk about it. Just put three graces into your Expedition 44 yeah. search. I think but, it's in our second episode of our gospel okay. video. But the idea was that we, we kind of think of this as grace being this completely free gift that we don't have to return anything, yeah. you know? Like, okay, God gave this, now I'm just going to keep living. And the idea here was in the dance of grace that it was reciprocity, yep. that you wouldn't just accept this gift and not return the mm-hmm. gift. And so this starts in Leviticus. Yep. It's Old Testament thinking. And yep. when Matt teaches on the three graces and what grace really means, this is where he starts yep. every single time. Yep. So let's look at atonement. Atonement language in the English translations and especially in Leviticus, um, but most Americans don't get what it means. No, they so, kind of go with that at one mint and, uh-huh. you know, they take a, they, they don't get the purification parts of yeah, it. Yeah, so they'll read into the atonement here in Leviticus 1 and 4 of, oh, there's sins that need to be forgiven. There's um, reconciliation between God and man that needs to happen here. And really, like we said, all this was was, hey, God, I, thanks for inviting me to your house. Yeah. Here, here's a, a gift of thankfulness, please let me into your presence. So what you're going to find today is when you take that at one mint understanding, Mm -hmm. the etymological view of it, it's not going to make sense in Leviticus. And that's what a lot of people are trying to build out the New Testament idea of, of being purely forgiveness of sins and, you know, kind of coming to the altar to to ask for forgiveness over and over and over when that wasn't at all as we're going to find what the main idea in Leviticus was. Yeah, so um, we'll get more into atonement here in a minute, but uh, first let's look at blood, because blood is also in here. So guess what? Blood isn't applied to the offerer. Yeah. We always think of, oh, I'm covered with the blood of Jesus, New Testament kind of thing here, but 
In the sacrificial system in Leviticus, the blood is never applied to the offerer. Sometimes it gets applied to the priest or to the whole nation, but that's only like when the priest is being um, commissioned and the whole nation comes under the covenant. So really, when we're talking about, we're, we see like the blood of Jesus is applied to take away sins, but that isn't what's going on here in Leviticus. We have to read that into this. And so the disconnect is really here so we need to talk about the language now traditional jews or messianic jews really understand this mm -hmm. where our western evangelical person has no concept of it mm -hmm. so i remember the first time i brought a messianic jew to my very traditional home church and you know this is just a simple thing about communion and they're kind of coming up and, and talking about how, how we're all covered by the blood of Jesus. And though there is some truth to mm -hmm. that, it means something different than what it meant in Old Testament context. And I yeah. remember sitting next to, I think I was 19 years old, and this girl who was a Messianic Jew her whole life was mm -hmm. just listening to this, rolling her eyes over it, saying mm -hmm. like, you guys have no idea what you're talking about here. And mm -hmm. I think as you truly go back and you read the sacrificial system, you're going to find that this idea of blood covering everything, it's just not there. Yep. Yeah. So when the blood is applied to people, for instance, in Exodus 24, the blood is also sp it's splashed on the altar and on the people specifically. And the splashing of blood is to consecrate people. Yeah. Um, it's basically the the making of the covenant. Yeah. That's what it happened. Leviticus 8, you kind of get the same yeah. thing. You you read this because it's the, they say it's the right ear, the thumb, and the big toe. toe. And you're going, yeah. why? I, what is the yeah. significance of that? But when you think about it, it's what you it's hear. <laughs> what you hear. The, the thumb is going to be the most central part of what you do. In uh -huh. fact, in Old Testament times, it's kind of interesting. Normally in other cultures, if you were in battle and you were taken as a slave, they couldn't afford to feed you, so they would cut your thumb off so you would be identified as somebody who couldn't fight. In honor, if your thumb was cut off, mm -hmm. you were done fighting. It yep. was a way of not, a merciful way of not killing you, but saying you'll never fight another battle. Yep. Yeah, so, um, yeah, sometimes sacrifices, like you said, or that, but blood is never applied to a person in the Torah at all for forgiveness of sins. Yeah, period. crazy. At all. Period, yeah. At all. So what, <laughs> Sit on that one for a minute. Yep. Write it down and let it work on you. Yep, so you won't find it anywhere right. in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the laying on of hands is the next thing. So the issue with laying on of hands, um, most evangelicals will think of as the transferring of sin from yourself to the animal who's dying in your place. Yeah. But Which, this is going to be problematic, because when do we lay hands on people today? To ordain them, to set well, them apart. We're set setting apart. them apart, and so are we transferring the sins <laughs> of all the people onto them? No, that wouldn't make any sense. No, so the laying on of hands is really a symbol of someone being set apart for a purpose. Like, these animals are being set apart, specifically here with the burnt offering, it's being set apart for a gift of reciprocity to come in before the Lord's presence. So when do we read this? We read it when there's two goats. One goat mm -hmm. is going to be offered up. The other goat is going to be the priest is going to lay their hands on the head of the goat and they're going to set apart this goat and they're going to send them off into the wilderness. Now, this is where people get the idea of sin transference over mm -hmm. there. And so um, even some translations of the Bible are going to use that sin transference word when they're talking about this. Uh, I think it's Leviticus 16, 16 that yep. goes into it. And it's important to kind of think what that means. So... This is where Matt and I might differ slightly on this view. Um, I don't think the sacrificial system, I agree with Matt here, has nothing to do with the transference of sin. I, I strongly believe that. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about the goat, it wasn't, the hands weren't themselves transferring anything like that. Mm -hmm. The hands were just saying this goat is going to be set apart yeah. to go wander off into the wilderness. And the idea there was die away. Yeah. And so, yep. so they're going to find a Gentile to walk away with this goat and take him away. But there was an understanding that at some point there was a transference that these things mm -hmm. were no longer part of their communal living. So yeah. that they were they were going to be made pure by doing that. So when we take the laying on of hands, it's really just to set the animal apart um, for a purpose. 
um, so that it wasn't to transfer sins. So um, when we look at this first uh, offering, the burnt offering, we, we have that um, the laying on of hands here is just this animal being set apart to be a gift to enter God's presence. So what this is really about so far, just, just to keep things clear, is what we're talking about is a system of purification to enter into sacred space. And this is going to be really devout. I mean, we're going to get a lot of the law kind of coming to how do you remain pure in the eyes of God? And that's really what this is about. And that's why there's a huge disconnect with communion today uh -huh. because they went into all these means to become pure. And at some point we want to say, oh, God's done with that. It's the new covenant when actually the new covenant is just totally overemphasizing yeah. the need to go back to this. So that I get back to was the ideal part of this was God wanted them to enter into sacred space with all kinds of seriousness. seriousness. The less ideal part was the blood. That might have yeah. been like, okay, I'll take you where you're at so that you can understand what's really my ideal or more important to me. Yep, so let's get back to atonement here. So there's six different um, kippur words in Hebrew. Four of them are nouns, two of them are verbs, and these, uh, this is the word that we translate as atonement. Yeah. Um, so occasionally we're gonna hit a verb as we're going through this, um, That's and that's something that might have to do with taking care of an offense or, or yep. sin. So, But the basic sense of this word means to purge. Yep. It's an Akkadian word, kapuru, uh, which basically means to wipe clean or to purge. And so when we think of uh, the blood of the offering being used to purge the tabernacle yep. here, it's being put on the articles of the temple and not on, not on people. The altar, so it's yeah. never applied to a human, like we said. And it really, it's not about... The, the offerer's sin, it's about the sacred space being clean. It's creating a safe yeah. space like wearing a hazmat suit going into a nuclear reactor. <laughs> so that's the idea that this takes time. It takes your best. It mm -hmm. takes everything you have. It's not yep. just this five minute ordeal. So it's preparing your heart. And mm -hmm. remember, this is communal. This yep. is your immediate family, but also your friends and all mm -hmm. who are representing that you are actually going to come into covenant with the most high. Yeah, and humans were, were mortal, were dirt creatures, <laughs> yeah. dirty, if you take the Genesis view. And this is really about someone who's that mortal coming into the space of a holy, like, God. The two substances can't really coexist together, and so that's the purpose of, like, the sacrifice stuff, is creating that clean space so that we can dwell together in purity with God. Now, this is where a lot of people in Reformed theology kind of get this a little bit off because they take what Matt just said about being dirty mm -hmm. and they kind of look at that as moral sin. Moral sin or totally incapable of anything yeah. on themselves yeah. when that's not at all what this was saying. God was saying, you are capable. You're mm -hmm. dirty, but through a clean, cleanliness process, mm -hmm. you are going to be able to come into yeah. my presence. So. Yeah. It actually, if you start here, you know, kind of that whole idea of the complete inability mm -hmm. of man doesn't really flush out according to Leviticus 1 through 5. Yep. All right. So um, at this point, read Leviticus 2 and 3, and we're going to get into the different offerings that they have there. We have the grain offering and the peace offering. So this video is probably going to be over an hour, but as you're watching it, I'm going to challenge you to just take some days on this one. Uh -huh. I mean, it's really pause, read, pause, read, get the mm -hmm. full the full effect, treat it as a Bible study. Yep. So in Leviticus 2, we got the grain offering. So the, the priest offers a fistful of grain to God and the priests kind of get the rest, the, yeah. the bread, the dough. And so it has to be without yeast. So yeast represented sin. So it has to be a unblemished offering. Like the, the previous offering had to be a, the animal had to be unblemished as well. Yep. Now you're going to see that they add salt to this sometimes, and I could make a whole video on why they add salt. Uh -huh. And someday I'm going to, because it's, it's very fascinating. But this is the idea, again, of bringing your best. So in ancient times, salt was not easy to get. This was something that was highly favored and mm -hmm. they would take they would travel days to yep. bring back salt and, and they had people that solely dealt in that commodity and it was typically you know something set aside for like royalty and kings mm -hmm. because it was so 
thought after. So what, what they're saying here is you need salt, something set aside for royalty to bring to the most high. And so it was a sense of seasoning and it did create an aroma. We don't think of salt, it's kind of a bad translation because yeah. yeah. it meant a lot of different things besides that. But even the aroma, when you would smell this in the camp, you would be reminded of mm -hmm. you're approaching the sacred space of the Most High. Yeah, we went over a little more salt stuff in our first episode of our Sermon on the Mount series yeah. for being the salt of the yeah, earth. Yeah, good and connection. So, so make that connection in the New Testament thing. So salt really here, um, and it was supposed to be put on all the sacrifices, yeah. but specifically here, it, it's about uh, the covenant. that we t It talks about in the Old Testament a lot, a covenant of salt. So it was something that reminded you of you are God's people and it's a, basically a thank offering for the covenant and for God selecting you as his people. Now again, salt's a bad, a, a bad understanding yeah. because yeah. it meant a lot of other things. But yeah. what this is doing is it's the Kadosh thing again. Mm -hmm. It's taking something, salt didn't, if you went to Canaan and said, hey, do you have some salt? They wouldn't be thinking Yahweh most high. Mm -hmm. They would say, oh, that's, that's only for kings. You don't get any of that. Yeah. And so this is something that God is taking and he's saying, I'm going to take what your understanding of your cultural context is and I'm going to apply that to the way that I want to reveal my holiness yep. and how I want you to be sacredly yep. and set apart. Yep. God is your king. Yes. So that's that. So the next is the peace offering. Most translations translate it as a peace offering. So in Leviticus 3, we, we, we get that here. In Hebrew, it's uh, Javak Shalomim, yep. I believe that's it. I'm not great at Hebrew. But, but pretty close. Yeah. Like that. So um, it's... You forgot the like, oh, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's probably better translated. And a lot of scholars such as uh, Levine and Milgram say that it's better to be translated as the well-being offering. So the Shalomim thing, you'll hear the, the Shah part and it's got the same kind of root as um, is Shalom. Yeah. So, and Shalom means peace, but it also means uh, be well. So this is another place where um, I, I'm debunking a lot of things as mm -hmm. we go here. And yeah. this is where you get prosperity gospel thinking. Yeah. Is they, they want to take this back to the Old Testament and say prosperity gospel thinking was in the Old Testament. And it's this idea of reciprocity or, again, it kind of goes back to the three graces. Mm -hmm. And it's not there. It's, it's the idea of living at peace, mm -hmm. but it's also more of a sacred context of that. In fact, you know, prosperity gospel would say, the more you give, the more you get, mm -hmm. you know, that, that there's a retribution principle going on there. And what we learned through the Old Testament over and over is that's not the case. Yeah. That may be the case, but consistently it's not the case. Because you do this, it doesn't mean that you're going to do that. But there's an expectation that if I give you, you're going to return that. Yep. Yeah, so really, so what we saw with the first offering was spending time with God. Second offering is... Um, remembering the covenant and that God is your king. Third one here is really it's just a thank offering to God. It, it, yeah. It's thanking God for the well-being. So is there a place for sin within this offering? Not at all. It's not, it's not even in the context no. at all. So we got. But there is a sin offering. There is so a sin offering. So let's get to that. But before we do, I want you to understand that when you're reading peace offering, there's nothing about sin within yeah. the peace yeah. offering. Yeah, it's not paying off a debt so that you'll be at peace with God. It's thanking God for the peace that he's given you and the well-being, the, the prosperity of your crops Covenant and your animals. relationship. It, it's yeah. just saying, hey God, here's some of my best back. Thank you for yeah. blessing me. Thank you for the covenant relationship that you're offering mm -hmm. me to a deity. The God, this is so uncommon in this area. Like mm -hmm. people didn't have this relationship. So this is yep. God's ideal saying that I want to come commune personally with you. I'm going to guide you in my cloud and you know take you and provide for every need. And the peace offerings were given for that understanding. Now there is a sin offering, but it's probably not what you think. Yep. So in the sacrificial system, there was no sacrifice for the forgiveness of, un, uh, of intentional sins. We mentioned this on the introduction video, and this is really important foundationally to understand. So when you're talking about intentional sin or transgressions, the Old Testament uses a lot, something that you deliberately do, the word there is kareth. 
that mm -hmm. it's going to use. And that's completely different than these. And so was there an offering for Kareth? Well, there are a whole bunch of them. If you, mm -hmm. if you did something that bad, if you committed uh, a murder knowingly, there were going to be some serious consequences yep. to doing that. Or and, ev and eventually you would have to purify, but people take it wrong thinking that those those offerings or those purification rites are to be are, are to pay for what you did when there were other consequences for that. Yeah. And the law was very clear about that. So we need to keep them separate. Yeah, and especially if we go look at David, what he says after he com basically commits adultery and murders. Yeah. He doesn't say, oh, I should go offer a sacrifice. He, right. He begs God for forgiveness yes. and repents, yeah. and God forgives him. Yeah. There was no sacrifice involved. So what you're going to find in almost all of these Old Testament sacrifice and offerings is it was not about intentional sin. It was going to be, if you intentionally sin, that's where forgiveness comes in. That's where saying, Lord, I did this, and I, I'm remorseful about it, mm -hmm. and I need forgiveness. And that's an important part of your relationship yeah. with God, but it's also important to say that that's not linked to offering and sacrifices. Yeah, and now this is an offering, so it gets completely burnt up. It's not um, a sacrifice, not yep. a community meal. So let's talk a little bit. This is called uh, the hatat offering. And so hatat by itself means sin, um, and it's connected with, with offerings. So, but it's a little bit confusing. So if you just go look it up in a lexicon, you see hatat is offering, is, is a, a sin offering. But when we look at the context of what a hatat offering was for, it's a little bit broader than just a payment for sins. So this is one where I'm going to say it's very difficult to track. I started mm -hmm. out in Hebrew saying some things are very connected and some of them aren't. And some words we know of meant very specific mm -hmm. things and some don't. And this is one that we're going to have not a very good handle on. In fact, I don't know that any, you know, we're, we're not going to be making doctrines over this mm -hmm. because it's too vague in the Old yeah. Testament. And so uh, you, you kind of might remember, uh, you know, stories of, of purification. There's one with seven bulls, seven lambs, seven rams, seven he goats. And the idea that the blood is going to be purified there, we'll get to some of that stuff. But the, the basic idea here in Leviticus 5, the sin offering, is, is that you're going to be covering things that you don't know about. Yep. Yeah, so when we look specifically here about the sin offering, um, it's it requires... Like I said, people, it might not be necessarily moral offense right. because you get other things that are simply about ritual purity. Like if um, a woman is menstruating, they make a sin offering. Yeah. Is there anything sinful about that? Yeah. No. If a guy has a nocturnal emission, he's deemed unpure ritually to come in. He needs to make a sin offering. Is, yeah. Has he has he sinned? If Not you necessarily. Touched, if you touch the corpse, yeah, now, dead you're body. supposed to bury the dead. So obviously you're going to have to touch them. This doesn't mean that they were walking around pushing them with sticks Sticks. so they wouldn't yeah. touch them. It was just a sense that in life you're going to do things that you know we use we use the word sin to mean these more transgressional offenses in our language, but in Old Testament thinking. That word sin was much more vague yeah, than that. It and really so, just meant unpure according to the covenant, yes, ritually unpure. Exactly. And so what we're talking about here is in day-to-day -day living, you're going to come in contact with things that the Bible identifies as sin, even though in our Western mind, we don't think of those things as yeah, necessarily sin. Because these things aren't immoral. Yeah, they're they, not They don't make you immoral. Right. Like touching a dead body doesn't make you immoral. But they still make you unholy. They uh -huh. still take you farther away from God. And if you were to do that over and over and over, it would be more difficult to get into the presence of God. Now, this flushes out into a lot of theological thinking. Mm -hmm. so in fact, we did a whole eschatology series and there's some really crazy ideas of different levels or rings of mm -hmm. heaven and hell and things like that. And, you know, there is an idea also that goes along with this, that those that were in battle were so kind of defiled by sin. And people that don't understand this idea that sin wasn't always intentional, mm -hmm. that they, they are not holy enough to enter into places. So you might remember 
why couldn't David get Build to the, the temple? Because he was a, a, a person war. of war. Mm -hmm. and, and as he would defile himself in that kind of sin, God wasn't saying, oh, you, you sinned all this your whole life. You need to really like come back and say this. Those offerings were already given. God was okay with that. Uh -huh. But there were still rules that mm -hmm. needed to be followed. Yeah, he was a man after God's own heart. So he's morally right with God, but still had sin because he was ritually unclean because of that. Yeah, so the big, Jesus is important. Yeah, yeah. Um, so before we get to Jesus, uh, let's look at blood first. So um, it says in Leviticus that the life of the animal and the life of the person is in the blood. So if we think of this rather as purification rather than a sin offering, a purification offering, yeah. because remember, the blood in this offering gets applied not to people, but to the tabernacle, different things in the tabernacle. It gets sprinkled on yep. to purify, to atone, to purge the the To God's. make dirty people clean in yep. God's eyes. Yep, and, and the dirt that we bring into God's presence to wipe it out. It's yep. just like dirt is cool outside your house, but right. when it comes inside, it's not, not so great cool, in yeah. there. <laughs> so it's kind of the same way. You got to keep the dirt out. So, so when um, the blood is seen as a life force, that covers and purges sin. It's a ritual detergent, as Jacob Milgram says. Yeah. Um, so yeah, when we see Jesus, um, ritually unclean people, like the woman who was bleeding, touch Jesus and get healed. So rather than Jesus in the Gospels becoming unclean, and that's the way in Leviticus that happened, if you touch someone that was unclean, you took on that disease of sin, but it was biological in their mind. Yeah. Uh, but with Jesus, when he gets touched, he heals them and he doesn't become unclean. So I get really tired of listening. Uh, you hear this in a lot of sermons and almost every altar call. You get mm -hmm. kind of the baggage of sin and forgiveness and, you know, being made clean. And that's not really what this is talking about. It's like mm -hmm. this, there's a stain of sin, but that stain is a contaminant and and we need purification for mm -hmm. it. So the sin offering was more about God's space than yeah. it was about the people's yeah. sin. It was about which the dirt that you track in. Yeah. That's more what it was about. Um, so yeah, so looking at atonement here again, uh, kafar uh, means to cover to, um, or to conceal. It's not like you're hiding sins from God's view, but like we talked about, the blood is a ritual detergent. It basically purges the sanctuary of the stain of sin. Yeah. And so blood was seen as a good thing and not as something that was like a payment or yes. or a punishment. We don't have this concept in our Western mm -hmm. thinking. Like we don't think of like, I if I need to clean something, I'm not going to go kill an animal and sprinkle the blood all over mm -hmm. it to clean it. No, I'm going to get a power washer and blast, blast it, it, you and, know? And that's essentially <laughs> what the blood was, a yeah. power washer for the sanctuary. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. So, um, so really, when it comes to the purification of forgiveness, God says, basically, okay, you've taken care of my sanctuary, and you've done what I've asked, you brought your hatat offering, the purification offering, the decontamination has happened, you've done this in good faith, I've seen that you're obedient, you're allegiant, yeah. and you're forgiven. So, it's really important that this is like a laid back God thing. Mm -hmm. This is saying, listen, don't, don't overwork this, but I want you to enter into my sacred space the right way. And throughout the entire covenant from the beginning of the Bible, it doesn't matter which covenant you're looking at in the Old Testament, they're all by faith. Mm -hmm. And I love that, that, it, you know, just, just essentially saying that if your heart is right and you come to me and you, you show me that I'm the most important thing, that's what I'm asking for. And mm -hmm. don't get hung up in this thing. I'm going to meet you at the blood because that's the way you think right now. And I'm going to yeah. use that and yeah. we're going to work through it. But it's, it's, I want the cleanliness of your heart. That's yeah, what I'm going for. It's not a for. quid pro quo. Right. It's, and when we take this to New Testament theology, Jesus's blood, pure, like the blood purified the temple. Jesus's blood purifies the temple. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So that's what the connection is. And it's important that there's no sense of purchase of forgiveness here. Mm -hmm. and, and we get that a lot, but it's just, it's totally God's sacred space. There's no purchasing thing going on here. Yep. So let's get into the guilt offering. Um, so I would say read Leviticus 5, 1 to 7, and we're just going to get into that. So pause it, read that. In fact, if you haven't just read the first eight 
chapters in Leviticus five, five to eight, yeah. eight then then sit down and read that right away. But yeah. we're gonna we're gonna read Leviticus five. Yeah. So if any if anyone sins uh, in that he hears a public adjournment to testimony and he is a witness, whether he has seen or come to know the matter yet does not speak, he shall bear his iniquity. Or if anyone touches an unclean thing, such as a carcass or an unclean wild animal or a carcass of an unclean livestock or a car carcass of an unclean swarming things and is hidden from him, he becomes unclean and he realizes his guilt. Or if he touches human uncleanness or any sort of uncleanness, uh, maybe with which one becomes unclean and is hidden from him, uh, when he comes to know it and he realizes his guilt. Or if he utters from his lips a rash oath to do evil or to do good or any sort of rash oath that the people swear and is hidden from him and he comes to know it and he realizes his guilt of any of these things. When he realizes his guilt of these things and confesses the sin he has committed, the sin he has committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat or for a sin offering, and the Lord shall make atonement for him for his sin. He shall bring before the Lord his compensation, but he, if he cannot afford a lamb, he shall bring it before the Lord as his compensation for the sin he has committed. Two turtle doves, two pigeons for a sin offering. Now, so, sin here is better guilt offering. All right, so we have this word guilt, sin offering, guilt offering. We have to think of this in terms of reparation, mm -hmm. that, that there's something that's been damaged between us and God, and we need to mm -hmm. recognize what's been damaged and kind of think in terms of a restitution offering. Yeah, and the word here is asham, which is the word for guilt, um, where before hatat is the word for sin with the yep. previous offering. So that's why actually translating it as sin offering in, in here, which um, what I just copied and pasted, <laughs> um, was um, actually not a great translation. No. So it's more about that. But the whole thing here is about making restitution rather than so much you being guilty. It's about fixing it yeah. is, is the kind of the key here. It's not... It, so we're going to kind of see an exception here that it really isn't about moral absolution. Um, it's, it's more about there's an opportunity to pay restitution or reparations. And we'll see this if you keep reading the verses after verse 7. You'll, you'll see that really it's uh, you got to pay 20%. You got to make it and make an offering. So it's really whoever you've harmed, done guilt to, you're supposed to pay them back or pay... Um, the temple back if it's something from that. It also talks about if you've taken by yeah. accident something from the temple, that you need to pay that back to the temple. Um, so really it's about mending relationships with covenant community members. And it's about a sacrifice saying, hey God, I know I've broken the covenant and this is my repentance. Yeah. And so simply, I think that's a good summary of the, of the guilt offering. Yeah. And so it's not the animal being sacrificed in your place to purchase your forgiveness. Right. It's really about making restitution between parties that need to be reconciled. And right. some people kind of say, okay, are you paying restitution? And that's where a lot of the atonement theories come mm -hmm. out of is that there's there's this idea that we're having to pay this. I don't know that you should really think of it as a payment. That's, no. that's wrong thinking when you're putting it that way. Yeah, it, it's making restitution. We should, as covenant people, if we hurt another covenant person, want to make it right and go above and beyond. Yeah. Um, so that that's kind of the there. So here, it, the big picture isn't wrath, but it's rather justice. It's making wrongs right and setting sacred space back to purity. And this Matt kind of mentioned a twenty percent thing. This this again is a really like laid back way of dealing with this. We we kind of want to put God in this wrath language of do this or you know you can't be in my space where it's actually portrayed as the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. It's kind of just saying you know. If you've done this, if you've found yourself, you know, involved in temple stuff and you come home and you have this, like, there's ways we're going to work through this. Yeah. Like, you know, don't don't kill yourself thinking you can never be holy again or, you know, you got to jump through all these hoops. He's just saying... He's being merciful. <laughs> this is my mercy. Pay, pay whatever it's worth, you know, 20% more than the weight of a shekel, it might say, or yeah. something like that. There's a repayment, there's a restitution involved... But it's not, it's not this wrathful picture that people make it out to be. Yeah, so there's a couple of other sacrifices, but they're specifically for the priesthood. Um, you can read uh, Leviticus 6 and 7, which have those. Um, but pretty much we've gone through the five sacrifices that were for the people. All right, so let's just summarize those. The first one is a burnt offering. It's about a gift and just 
wanting to spend that time with God. Yep. Yeah, so the next one's uh, the grain offering. It's about remembering the covenant and God is your king. And then we have a peace offering and it's just saying thank you to God, yep. making peace. Yeah. Purification offering is about cleansing sacred space. It wasn't necessarily for moral wrongs and the blood never got applied to the people. So um, it, it's about uh, purifying God's house. And then we have the guilt and that's more of a reparation. I've done this and you know I need to repair my relationship with God to be made clean with him again. Yep. And then we got, when we saw the blood stuff that was involved in all of this. Blood is hard here. Yeah. So I love Greg Boyd writes some books about the bloodshed and the, you know, the violence in the old Testament mm -hmm. and things like that. We don't, I've, I've said this before and we actually made videos on mm -hmm. it. We don't think about blood the way that they thought in an old Testament context. Yep. So we, we think blood is gross and we actually kind of think of it to, you know, satanic rituals today mm -hmm. and things like that, it carries a different connotation because it's not part of our culture. Yep. Back then, it was part of their culture. And I'm going to just say again, it wasn't really God's ideal. He was meeting them and saying, okay, I'm going to take this, but I'm going to make it set apart yep. and, and make it mine to yep. be holy. Yeah. So remember, the blood was never applied to people with the exception of when the priest was commissioned or when the covenant community was the covenant was enacted at sinai um and no uh sin is seen as a stain here as we've seen through all of this um it sin represents the forces of death and since yeah. we saw life was in the blood right the blood is the forces of life so it's like we said the ritual detergent that purges um basically the stain of the forces of death from the community now keep that because our next episode is going to be day of atonement and we're really going to get into yeah. the life force of the blood there Yep, so when we get here, we need to talk about substitution. We talked about the setting on of hands. So that's kind of the, the recap thing here was about setting apart the animal rather than you placing the sins on the animal because it doesn't really work if you're going to be consistent of people being ordained by the laying on of hands or healed by the laying on of hands. It's really just being set apart. So if you're saying that Jesus is going to die as a substitute for us, there might be some truth to that. But if you go back to this Old Testament Levitical mm -hmm. standard, that's going to be extremely problematic to say something like and that. Yeah, like you said, Kadosh uh, set apart. These animals were set apart for death. Because right. the, really the big thing wasn't the killing of the animal. Yeah, you had to die to get its blood out. So it yeah. it had to die for, for that to be used, but at the same time, a lot of these sacrifices, really the major part of it, the ritual wasn't the killing of the animal, but the meal with God. Right. <laughs> so right. that's the big context of ancient sacrifice in Israel was about the community meal. So you've been making some connections to Jesus throughout this. We've mm -hmm. helped you make those connections. You can't not go to Jesus because that's what the atonement is all about. This yeah. all points to Jesus. So when you're looking at the framework of the cross, we don't see, I've, I've said this a few times, but we just don't see this wrath kind of language. And so if you're going to base your atonement theories on wrath, there's none of that that started in the Old Testament. I yeah. don't see a wrathful God going on here in the Old mm -hmm. Testament in terms of the sacrificial system. So, and then we got to ask, was forgiveness purchased at all here or was it given out based on faithful obedience. Yeah. Doesn't look like there's any purchasing yep. going on. And was there any debt language at Ooh, all in none, any of this? Did you none. see anything in these sacrifices? There aren't any courtrooms so far. Yep. So if this is the Old Testament framework for sacrifice, and if Jesus was seen as an offering and a sacrifice, then how should this change our view of the cross? And we've been dancing around this idea of, of does God require blood for forgiveness. That's that's a huge answer or question going into mm -hmm. atonement thinking is, is forgiveness necessarily linked or required as part of the sacrificial system? Yeah, and we saw that blood was for purifying sacred space and God can just forgive when we come to him in faith. Yeah. So, and that wasn't the way that the pagan deities worked, though. You had to appease them to get forgiveness. So from Western them. thinking, we actually think more like the pagan Pagans. deities. Yeah. We think of the Virgin being need to offer thrown into, into the, the fire volcano. or something yeah. like that. You know, yeah, so. and that is true. That's how pagan deities work, and we're stuck there in our Western minds. We're mm -hmm. still thinking about that and the 
you know, the Greeks also mm -hmm. thought that way. And so we're, we're kind of yeah. stuck there, but that's not what Jesus is. That's not what the Bible and yeah. Leviticus was saying or that uh -huh. Jesus was saying yeah. later. So when we picture Jesus that way as satisfying a uh, angry, wrathful God, we're actually putting Jesus into the framework of the pagan sacrifices rather than Israel's sacrifice yeah. system. So this is probably one of the hardest concepts for people to get, that when you look at the Torah, the Levitical sacrificial system, you're not going to see a connection between sacrifice and forgiveness. There might be talking about forgiveness, but the connection isn't really there. Forgiveness yeah. is separate than the sacrifice. Yeah, it's not a transaction. Yeah. You do one to purchase another. So in Torah, we have examples of forgiveness not connected to sacrifice. So we have forg oil. forgiveness by the application of oil. That's in Leviticus 14:19. The burning of flour in Leviticus yep. 5, we talked about that already. Um, the burning of incense in number 16. And this is where some of these things I said you mm -hmm. got to keep separate because you have incense that is part of the sacrificial system, like the mm -hmm. salt that we mentioned yep. and things like that. But then there's other times where you're seeing that. And I think that's where people get confused. That's where they start to throw them all in the same basket mm -hmm. and they say they're together, but they're not. You need to still separate. Yep, and you also got the payment of money in um, Exodus 30, um, gifts of jewelry in yeah. Numbers 31, the release of an animal into the wilderness. Yeah, and, uh, scapegoat. Yep, yeah, scapegoat in Leviticus 16, and just plain appeals to God in prayer. Exodus yeah. 32 is an example of that. So yeah, so... A famous passage for healing uh, and forgiveness is, we hear it all the time, Second Chronicles 7.14 about God forgiving Israel, basically the whole thing about if my people are called by my name, prayer of repentance, pray, yes. A prayer of repentance. No I, blood! I will forgive their sins and heal their yeah. land. Yeah. It doesn't say I will sacrifice no. a goat and... There's no sacrifice there at all. Yeah, no. Yeah. But the biggest one that will usually get pushed back from evangelicals is in Hebrews chapter 9, where there's, they translated, um, there's no forgiveness of sins without the shedding of blood. Yeah. And so that, that's kind of the big thing. But if you read Hebrews 9, 18 through 27, you'll get a bigger context. Yeah. So I'll read that quick here, and then we'll just wrap up with just a couple things after that, because this is the big one where evangelicals get hung up on and they take this verse and assume that blood sacrifice is required for sins and then they read that back into the sacrificial system. So we're going to read it for the first time and I want you to uh, you know read differently, read within a yeah. little more contextual yeah. understanding than what and you have everything that we this. just told you in your yeah. minds. So yeah. Um, this is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll and all the people. He said, this is the blood of my covenant when the Lord commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and everything used in its ceremonies. In fact, the law requires nearly everything to be cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things purified with sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice than these. For Christ did not enter the sanctuary made with human hands that was a copy of the true one. He entered into heaven itself and now appears for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again the way that the priests enter the most holy place year after year with blood that is not their own. Um, otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but he appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin, um, the sacrifice himself. Just as people are destined to die once and then face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away sins for many, and he'll appear a second time not to bear sins, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. All right, so there's a few things we want to point out about this. And again, this is one we could write, we could do a whole video yeah. just on this one, but we're, yeah. we're just going to keep this pretty brief. Yeah. So the first thing I want you to notice is we don't see blood being applied to the people. And yeah. I think in theology, you hear people trying to do that a lot, mm -hmm. that they're trying to apply the blood to the people. And we've alluded to this several yeah. times, but the idea is to cleanse the sanctuary, yep. to make it sacred space. Yep. And it's not, a, uh, it's about things being cleansed by the blood, not about wrath being appeased or a purchase or, or a basically debt connected anywhere here. 
So Hebrews puts Jesus and his blood in the same context as Leviticus. Um, based in Leviticus, over and over they had to purify the temple with the blood. Here Jesus once and for all is a sacrifice. And Now this is, this is cool too, that, yeah. that we get this, that in, in the Old Testament in Leviticus, there's things that are kind of outlined just for the Israelites, mm -hmm. but we're going to see this in the Old Testament as kind of an open door to Gentiles too. Yep. And so we're always looking for that, like where... Where do the Gentiles into the picture? Obviously, they're part of the Messianic seed, so they're part of it. And this is one that's very clearly defined and, and is part of Hebrews. So it starts in the Old Testament, and it flushes into the author of Hebrews. And Paul hits on a lot of this in his writings as well. Yeah, and as we saw in the last episode, to be forgiven was to return from exile into God's yeah, presence. Right. And so that connects really well here. Um, the last thing to note in Hebrews 9.22 um, the forgiveness stuff here is in the indicative mood. It it means that in the tep in the text it's a description and not a command. So so God is free to forgive without yeah. the sacrifice, and yeah. that's good for us because we're not constantly making sacrifices and we're yeah. still asking for forgiveness. Yeah, and so basically to say that God is held under the law that he can't forgive that the lawgiver is held under the, under the law. <laughs> right. Basically, it restricts God's sovereignty and basically his freedom to forgive by tying his hands. Yeah. Basically saying that a sacrifice has to happen for forgiveness. Yeah. And basically we know from Matthew nine six, Jesus says, "I want you to." Know Oh, the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Yeah, and there's a lot of places where we read this. I mean, you get this in in uh, Matthew eighteen twenty two and Luke twenty three, John eight eleven, yeah, and John twenty. You could just keep going, but I think what what I want you to understand is once you get this into the framework of your mind, you're you're going to read it this way yeah. every time, rather than to understand it the traditional way that you've probably kind of worked. <laughs> Uh, sin and offerings and sacrifices yeah. all bunched in into the same basket. Too. Yeah, and even in the Old Testament, God tells the prophets over and over that God, that God didn't want sacrifices. He wanted their hearts. And this is important because yeah. the people don't get it. And mm -hmm. they don't get it because they're stuck in the, in the other deities system. Yeah. They're trying yeah. to appease the Yahweh the way that they're trying to appease the other God. And mm -hmm. God is saying, don't do that. Be set apart mm -hmm. for holiness in me because I'm the most high. I'm different than all of those. I'm going to let you approach me in some of the mm -hmm. same ways because that's your understanding of deities, but I'm going to take you to a better place. Yeah, and, and it, it's the big thing is like they they saw this sacrificial system as, as a way of getting in good with God and yeah. then the ritual, doing the ritual would make me make me good with God rather than God just wanted the, the thing there using part of the culture as in a way that they could obey God yeah. and a way that they could they could be allegiant to God and so the premise of this film is to understand the sacrificial system mm -hmm. of Leviticus to understand that God is saying I'm going to meet you where you're at but there are some things that I want you to understand in coming to sacred relationship mm -hmm. and covenant with me and this is what I want you to understand and it's not that Matt and I uh, are just angry against uh, PSA. No. We're not that way at all. It's just that when you look at PSA, we're both Old Testament guys. We both say it can't exist in the New Testament if it doesn't have the foundation in the Old Testament. And the whole idea of PSA is, is strongly, you know, contorted from the New Testament, almost pushing the Old Testament aside. Yeah. When you take the Old Testament, it doesn't work together. Yeah. So penal substitution pretty much ignores all of the Old Testament foundations that we saw here for sacrifice and offering. And, and it says that God still demands blood in order to take away sins. So let's do a couple points here in conclusion. And, we'll and you're, you're going to get this with other atonement theories too. I mean, yeah. we're not just throwing rocks at PSA. We're kind of also throwing rocks at ransom ransom, and some sub substitutionary atonement yeah. theories and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So there's a few of them that don't fit. Right now, we're we're kind of leaving it to you to figure all this out. We, yeah. we never really want to give you the answers and just say, this is our view on it, but we want you to work through it and get to it. So mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of go back to that great divide that there's a few theories that kind of land on this side of the fence, and there's a few that land on this side of the fence. And Mm -hmm. those ones there is a C between they don't mm -hmm. really interact together either you're kind of here or you're there so you've got substitutionary ransom and PSA over on this side and you've got some of the other ones like Christus Victor and 
you know, mm -hmm. the, pretty much all the rest of them on this, yeah. this side of the arena. Mm -hmm. And those are interchangeable, and these are kind of interchangeable with each other, but they don't usually work very well trying to mix them together. Yeah, so on one side you get appeasement, and the other side you get purification. Yeah. So those are kind of the two, yep. the two camps that you have to choose one or the other. They do don't you, really overlap. Do you want biblical or etymological? Yeah, so, um, so a few things here. We find it difficult to translate kafar, atonement, with any real consistency in the Old Testament. It's got a wide range of meanings. It doesn't always mean appeasement or... <laughs> and Matt makes this point because you're going to get some of these some of these theories that are going to take a verse with uh -huh. kafar in it and say, oh, this is what it means. Well, uh -huh. that's what it meant in that verse, but that's, that's not saying over and over. And that is our big mm -hmm. bone with systematic theology yeah. compared to biblical theology is that you're taking one thing and you're grouping them all together saying yeah. they all mean the same thing when particular in the old testament that is more untrue than it is true yeah i think that they use this word when jacob's going out to meet his brother to seek um to basically be make amends with him for cheating him out of his covenant right. and it says that he covered his face he yeah. kafard right he, did he atone for his face <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so so yeah the second thing is we find many places in the old testament um where forgiveness could happen without blood atonement can happen without blood it it doesn't require blood so this is important because God, what we're doing is we're showing you the preface that blood wasn't God's ideal. Mm -hmm. This this was a place where he met man and they mm -hmm. understood because of royalty and, you know, the purification agents. So he uses it as an earthly means mm -hmm. to bring, to make it set apart. And I've been yep. emphasizing that over and over and over. But if you're... Nobody really thinks yep. this way. If you're watching the video, you've probably never considered this before. And it's really important foundationally to the understanding of not just your atonement theory, mm -hmm. but to every theological part of your framework. Yeah, the next thing is atonement is extremely covenantal. Yes. And so we see that it's only used within the covenant community. Those living outside of the Abrahamic covenant, um, we don't see atonement in use for. And in the Old Testament, we mentioned that there's a couple times that there's like this weird, you know, offering, I'll use the word, mm -hmm. to those outside of that covenant. But the idea is that they're going to be grafted into the covenant. Yeah. Now, we're not saying here that this is some kind of limited atonement Calvinistic thing. It's no, right. you have to, for the atonement to work, you have to come into the community. Right. And that's what we're saying. <laughs> we're not saying that Jesus' blood didn't cover or doesn't atone for the whole yeah. world. No, it's saying that it atones for the covenant community yeah. and we're not going to get into election and predestination and stuff like that. So, so <laughs> at the end of the day, after you've watched this video, after you've spent three days going through Leviticus and doing this, what I want you to really get is that the sacrificial system in Leviticus was a little bit of a signpost. It was, you know, we've said it before that the law was kind of a stopgap until mm -hmm. the Messiah got there. And that's the same way of thinking. God is going to meet people where they are, but he's mm -hmm. going to ask them to go further. Yep. And this, we don't get the full culmination of this until the Messiah comes. All of it in Leviticus is setting the tone for what Christ is going to Yep. make complete yep so yeah so sacrifice here is not a payment it's in terms of relationships being restored sometimes or maintaining of the sacred space but really when we talk about forgiveness connected to this it really came down to faith and fidelity yeah. were the symbols that were behind the ritual and without that the ritual itself means nothing. Yeah. So coming back to it, God is taking his people and he's saying, I know you're dirty. This stuff just happens. It's part of life. You're, you're going to do this stuff. But I want a system so that you can understand me because part of your understanding of appeasing the gods is really messed it's up. <laughs> yeah. so, so come to me and I'm going to walk you through one step at a time to bring you closer to the holiness that I'm calling you to. And eventually I'm going to reveal through the cross a blood that's going to cover forwards and backwards but you better understand that according to the Levitical system and not probably to what you've been taught your entire life. Yep. 
So thanks for joining us today on our journey through atonement. Next week, we're going to talk about the Exodus, and then we are going to talk about the Day of Atonement. God bless you and keep you.